కన్నమందలాకారం వ్యాప్తం చరాచరం తత్పదం దర్శితం తస్మై శ్రీ గురువే జ్ఞానంజన శలక చక్షురు తస్మై శ్రీ గురువే నమ గురుర్బ్రహ్మ గురు విష్ణు గురుర్దేవో మహేశ్వర గురు సాక్షాత్ పరబ్రహ్మ తస్మై శ్రీ గురువే నమ గురు మధ్యే స్థిత మాత మాతృ మధ్యే స్థిత గురు గురు మాత నమస్తే మాతృ గురు నమ్యహం ధ్యానమూలం గురుమూర్తి పూజామూలం గురుపదం మోక్షమూలం గురువాఖ్యం మన్ మంత్రమూలం గురువాఖ్యం మోక్షమూలం గురో కృపా ధ్యానమూలం గురుమూర్తి పూజమూలం గురుపదం మంత్రమూలం గురువాఖ్యం మోక్షమూలం గురో కృపా
There's this great Rumi poem. Kevin, do I have a, a monitor for questions? Okay. Okay. Um, there's a great Rumi poem with, I forget how it starts. Uh, so many great ones. <laughs> Anyways, guys saying I've been, you know, trying to break down the door of love and he realizes he's been knocking from the inside. The only thing that keeps us locked out of our own hearts is our own stuff. It's not a mystery. It's our own stuff. So it behooves us to find a way to deal with it. Because if we don't deal with it, it deals with us. Very simple. And what's our stuff? Everybody knows exactly what it is. This last you know, couple of years being home has been really amazing for me. By Maharaji's grace, all the bills got paid. There was always coffee in the morning. Speaking of which, it's always morning somewhere. <laughs> <clears throat> and I, you know, I'd been running around for, since 1994, I started singing with people. and touring pretty much nonstop, except when I went to India, which has its own mishigas, to use a Sanskrit word. <clears throat> so being home was I just, I remember sitting on the couch in the living room and all of a sudden I went, I can sit here? I didn't have any bags to pack. I didn't have any plans to make. I didn't have any prescriptions to fill because I'm going to be on the road. Where am I going to be? Blah, blah, blah. I didn't have, I could not believe that I could just sit there on the couch. It was unbelievable. I mean, I hadn't sat, because every, up until that moment, every time I sat down, it was always just a short break before I had to go somewhere. And now, I didn't have to go anywhere. I couldn't go anywhere, which is what it took to slow me down. It took a, uh, it took a global pandemic to slow me down. Terrific. But wow, over the days, you know, you can't force, you can't, okay, now I'm going to sit, I'm going to quiet my mind. It's not quiet. Why isn't it quiet? I should be quiet. It's quieting. Quiet down. Okay, be quiet. You know? It doesn't happen like that. You have to give yourself some space. You have to, we have to develop this habit of allowing our stuff to settle. All the jabber that goes on all the time in our heads. And we listen to it constantly. It's like, isn't there anything else to do? No. I'm going to listen to my shit. <laughs> and I'm going to believe everything I tell myself about myself and everybody else. Because it's just our own stories that we're listening to, that we're seeing. I, I got my version of you all, and you got your version of me all. And who knows if there's any reality in any of it at all. It's just our version. 
we're completely stuck in our versions. Well, not completely, that's the good part. We're habitually stuck in our versions. We think, we actually believe everything we think. Why? But we do. So you can't think yourself out of a prison made of thought, right? Every thought itself is the prison because we, we're glued to it. We're glued to it and it's super ultra epoxy gorilla gel glue. And the only thing that dilutes that glue is grace. And if we're doing any practice at all, if we're interested in any of this nonsense at all, that's grace manifesting in our lives already. Otherwise, why would, why, you know, what are we doing here? There are a lot of other things to do. And it's impossible to imagine what it's like when we're not glued to our thoughts because we're thinking about what it's like, what it will be like when we're not thinking. It doesn't work. So that's what practice is for. That's what practice is. It's just letting go again and again and again and again, and again, and again, and again. If you want to learn how to play the guitar, you got to practice. If you want to play piano, you got to practice. If you want to quiet your mind, you've got to practice. Simple. And from that practice, it creates the room inside of us, so to speak, to grow, to deepen and to release the bondage of the stories that we believe about ourselves, all the things we believe. And believe, and believe me, there's a lot that we believe that has no reality whatsoever except in our emotional reality, which is one lifetime kind of stuff. So you, you, you practice, you have, you have to do something. And I, I know you know that. Otherwise, we, you know, you, we wouldn't be here. This is practice too, getting together. This is satsang, this is getting together for a common aspiration that we, we're aspiring to be, to be, get happy, you know, to find some real love and to calm our asses down. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that happens that we can measure every day. Today was a little bit better than yesterday, but I believe that just as much as I believed yesterday. So there's no, you can't get out of it that way. You just keep coming home again and again. Whether you're using mantra japa or watching the breath or chanting or any other practice, the idea of paying attention is, is universal to all those practices. Listening, paying attention to what you're doing. Some, some lineages say it doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you're paying attention, essentially. It does, you don't, doesn't have to be like certain holy stuff. Just pay attention to washing the dishes, wiping the dishes, blah, blah, blah. And that's very powerful practice too. But Maharaji said to us Westerners, we Westerners who were there at that time, 
from going on repeating the name of Ram or God's name, the name of God, everything is accomplished. Everything is accomplished. Everything's made full and complete. I mean, you know, that's, that's big time. If he said it, this, uh, it's true. You know, the thing about the feeling that we had about when being with Maharaji physically at that time was total trust. Absolute, I mean, just natural. It's like, when you go outside and it's a sunny day, you're in the sun, right? You feel it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to question, am I really feeling the sun? No, it, it's just, it's obvious. And that's exactly the way it was with him. There was no doubt about it. So when he said things, Even if we didn't understand them or couldn't really absorb, for instance, you know, I've said many times, we asked him, how do you find God? He said, serve people. Excuse me? What does serving people have to do with God? You know, we figured it out, you know. So maybe, okay, you know, how do you raise Kundalini? Feed people. What? It was beyond. Uh, we couldn't even imagine what, he, what it meant. He was just speaking from a wholly different place, a place of non-self, non-ego. From his point of view, there's only one. And if you help one, you're helping all. If you serve one, you're serving God because everybody is a part of that, actually a piece of that. A molecule in, in the, or a cell in the body of God. He never encouraged us to do spiritual practice for the sake of our own enlightenment. And that... It was like he knew something we didn't know, of course. <laughs> Think about it. Well, yeah. And that's how he described the path. Love everyone, serve everyone, remember God. <sighs> you know. And when he said, Ram nam karne se sapuro jatehe, I'm going on repeating the names of Ram, the names of God. Everything is accomplished. Now, if I had really... If I was karmically ripe enough to actually believe that 100% when I heard it, I would have not done anything else in my life from that moment until this moment except repeat the names of God. No TV, no movies, no nothing except... But I wasn't, and I'm not. I'm still not. I read those lines right here. They're written right here. I go, hmm, okay. <laughs> Maybe. But it's very simple. So if you want to know how you're doing, look at how, check how you spend your, your last 24 hours or your last 10 minutes. Where's your head been? Lost, dreamland, gone, totally not here. That's why we suffer, because we're like, uh, we're, we're in total reaction mode all the time. And in a time like this, that the world, the state that the world seems to be in right now, boy, there's so much anxiety and so much fear, and it, we're breathing it in and out all day long. 
So it makes it even more difficult to calm down because we take everything personally. We, we take everything as our own fear, our own anxiety, and we experience it in our own bodies and minds. And some of it might be ours, but on the other hand, it's just what we're breathing in and reading in the papers and hearing on the news and seeing the fear and the anxiety in everybody's face when you walk down the street, the panic. There's a lot to deal with. But we have to. I mean, you don't have to. You don't. You might want to, but you don't have to. You can, we can just go ahead and just snooze through the rest of our lives and then, boop, that breath didn't come in. Oh, guess I'm dead. So it might be a good idea to do some practice. Whatever that means to you. Because it's only our own stuff that causes us suffering. Period. Let's look at Ramdas. He had a catastrophic stroke. He was a speaker, a lecturer, a teacher. He had a catastrophic stroke. He could barely speak for the first few years of his after the stroke. Now, that could have destroyed someone else. But he was able to, because of his history, because of his, the fact of, that he'd been practicing and meditating and doing all kinds of things for so many years, he was able to continue that inner work and overcome the inner negativity from the stroke, the inner stuff. And he was very happy. Another person who had a stroke might have been completely destroyed. And you've seen it, you've seen people who have something happens and something really painful, terrible happens and they're just destroyed by it. It's not required that we get destroyed by what happens in the outside world. It's not a requirement. It's not, we don't have to let that happen. But it's up to us. And when I say it's up to us, I don't necessarily mean uh, who we are right now is the culmination of many things. So when I say it's up to us, it's not like, okay, I'm now going to meditate for the rest of my life. We can't do that. That's not who we are. But we can start to uh, do what, what our hearts tell us we, we should be doing. We have to listen to our, our hearts, our intuition. We must, otherwise we're just getting blown around by the wind, like a, like a, a dried out leaf with no roots and can't do anything, can't, can't find a way through the day. We, we can't control what, what's happening in the outside world. The only place that we might be able to get a vote is inside. How we meet each moment. How we react to each moment. How we live in each moment that arises. That's where we, where we could develop some inner strength, some power to not be pushed around by our own reactions to whatever's happening. 
And who knows, that might have some effect on the outside world. The saints, all the saints say that what's going on in the world now is the result of our minds. This is us. So, if that's true, then if we quiet our minds and open our hearts, that makes just a little bit less bullshit out there. A little less negativity. But even if it doesn't change the way the world is going, it will certainly change how we feel and how we interact with everything that arises in our own lives, which is really all we can ask of ourselves. We can't tell people not to be the way they are. It doesn't work. But right now, we can't even tell ourselves not to be the way we are. But that's the only place that we can actually have some effect, some, some good effect. All right, well, you want some questions? Anybody have anything to say? Two years of thinking, <laughs> all waiting to explode. Hit me. Frank, relax, I know you. Not Frank. Frank knows how to get to me in the back door. Hi, let's see if this is working. You, you talk. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Louder. I heard you. That's good. Hi. Um, I was curious to know if you could speak a little bit more about Guru Seva. Guru Seva? <clears throat> well, Seva means service. And Guru is Guru. What else you want to know? Well, <laughs> my guru of seva. Uh -huh. and I'm curious, maybe just to dig a little bit deeper as to the understanding behind it. Mm -hmm. um, because she asks me, oh, are you pushing yourself? It's like, well, then why, why are you giving me this? But <laughs> I guess I just want to dig a little bit deeper in terms of either stories behind it or just experience with it. Huh. Well, there's too much about the situation I don't know. But if you accept your guru as knowing more than you do, at least, then you accept what they tell you as being for your own benefit, beyond what you could understand, possibly. And so you go ahead and you do it. And you don't think about it. And if you can't do it, then you try to figure out why you can't. What is it in you that's stopping you from... Because if you have a guru, uh, implied in that relationship is uh, the fact that you believe that the guru knows more than you do, and also would only do what helps you, what was good for you, and would know what was good for you. Now, not every so-called guru is that qualified. But I don't know who your guru is, and that's not for me to judge, even though I probably would. It's... Stop! Don't tell me. <laughs> On the other hand, moving right along. On the other hand, you know, uh, how you define guru is another thing, to how, we, how we define guru to ourselves. Now, you, you're defining 
part of your definition of guru, of guru is this person, this being. Now, my guru never told me what to do, except go away, <laughs> again and again, jiao. He used to say, go away is my mantra. <laughs> so, but it was understood that he, he never, he, he, In my, in my case, let's say he knew me well enough to know that if he told me what to do, it was a waste of time. And so he left it to me to find out. Well, actually he did. The last time I saw him, when I asked him, how can I serve you in America? Now, this is the last, turns out to be the last time I ever saw him in the body so far. And he said, ah. If you ask about service, it's not service. Just do what you want. Now, on a personal note, I'd been celibate for two and a half years. You know what I wanted to do? Not only did I know what I wanted to do, but he knew what I wanted to do. And he knew, I knew he knew what I wanted to do, and he told me, do what you want to do, and I'm sitting there thinking, how is that service to you? And he just laughed. My mind actually stopped. It was, it was like... <laughs> and he looked at me and he cracked up. It was really funny. And now here we are. This moment is a manifestation of his not telling me what to do. I had to find out for myself what I needed to do, what I wanted to do. And that's just the way he was with me. Maybe with other people he was different. But, um, and so as a result, I didn't sing for 21 years after he died. It took me 21 years to start singing with, as a practice. Because I was busy trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And the only way to know what you want to do is to do it and see if you like it. So I did a lot of stuff that I liked <laughs> for a moment until I woke up in the street, face down in the mud. Not literally. So a lot of it has to do with how you feel about the guru, what your relationship is. If you truly have full faith and full surrender, there's no question. The guru says this, you do that. The guru says that, you do that. But we're not in that place. So just the fact that your guru told you what your seva should be, you have to deal with why it is you're thinking about it all the time. Why you would even ask me, for instance. Right? It, it's a great... Whatever the guru intended, that's their business. What you're experiencing is your business. And so you have to work it out, don't you? <laughs> uh, good luck. <laughs> but a lot of it has to do with how we... First of all, on the other hand, guru is not outside. A real guru is your own soul, so to speak your own true nature. And they're speaking to you from inside of you. But it's a question of what we, we, have to, we have to really live with who we are. We can't pretend. Pretending is not going to make it. You and everybody else, we have to get, we have to really listen to our hearts. Really, what is this? Who am I? What do, what do I really feel? Do I really, do I want to have more faith than I actually have? And why is that? Do I really believe that a guru is, knows everything? Or is it just like, you know, a teacher that might be helping me if I decide to go along with it? It's an interesting place to be, isn't it? Yeah. Good luck.
is good work. And all the feelings you have about how you feel when you haven't been doing what they wanted you, what they told you to do, maybe they told you those things just to make you feel this way. Maybe. Maybe not. Only you know, and even you don't know. Even when you know, you won't know. So just do the best you can to figure out, or to just be, you know. I have a question. Where are you? I'm right here. Okay. I guess we're ready for your question. <laughs> um, I, I heard a um, kirtan on hanging out in the heart space that really struck me hard, and I'm wondering if you've recorded it any other place. And the, the words are upang dei, jayang dei, isho dei. Yeah, yeah. Close, but no cigar. Yeah. Okay. I had a feeling. <laughs> Yeah, sure. That's Nina. Yeah, that's that's on. Um, is that where is that? Oh, is it? Okay. That's called. We we call it uh, "Show Me Love" or something like that, right? Everybody knows better than me. I don't know where anything is, but it's there. Yes, I do. Thank you. Hi. Where are you? Right here. Oh. So my question is, when you're in the middle of the painful thoughts or the thoughts that really get to you, how do you work with that? Or how do you manage that or deal with that? You do your best to live through it. Could you give an example? I'm still breathing. You know, when the shit hits the fan, it goes everywhere. Then it's too late to do anything about it other than take a shower. <laughs> That's why they say do practice when you can. Because by doing practice when you can, you're actually changing the way things will unfold from the inside out. <clears throat> now, there's many, it, and there's other ways of dealing with it, there's, there's so many ways of dealing with everything that I'm manifesting in this moment. Uh, I'm not, I don't do those kind of practices that much. For instance, there's ways of recognizing that energy as it's rising. And when you notice it, like anger's coming, if you can get there early enough, it can dissipate. Or it can just go and you're with it in a different way. And the same with fear, all the negative emotions. But that, that implies we're already really kind of seasoned in practice. And those are specific techniques, tantric techniques for working with energy and emotional uh, energies. Um, <clears throat> for me, I mean, since you asked me, my main practice over the last 50 years has been the Hanuman Chalisa. The Hanuman Chalisa, as Maharaji said, is Maha Mantra. It's the great mantra. It's the powerful names of God. And he said many things about it. But the whole idea of Hanuman is that he, that that energy destroys negativity. So if I'm really screwed up, I mean, something that's been, and it's been going on, and I can't move it, and it's just torturing me, I will, I will have to, in order to get, you know, do something about it, and then relieve myself of that suffering, I will have to really do some serious practice. I'll have to do maybe 108 chalices in order to ch change the atmosphere. There's very little you can do once you're in the grips of something, if, for most of us, because we haven't been trained that way in our lives, right? So when it's really got us, or it's a long-term kind of deep kind of feeling, or a subtle way that kind of, you know, we're in this atmosphere that we can't get out of, you can do a lot of practice. You can do some serious practice. 
And just motivating yourself to do that already is a big thing. Because if things didn't hurt, we would never do any practice. It's because things hurt that we do practice. Whether it's overt suffering that's visible or it's subtle suffering that we can't put our finger on or it's this feeling that nothing will ever be enough, we can't find love, we can't find peace, we can't find this, our lives are all screwed up, that kind of suffering. One kind of suffering or another suffering is right here, right now, and it'll always be here. So the more we recognize that, the more we have motivation for doing practice. Because, I mean, this is not, this is a big thing. I mean, when Buddha came out of the jungle, that's the first thing he said. Hey, guess what? <laughs> There's always going to be suffering in this world. And here are the causes of suffering. And here are what you can do to relieve the, to remove the causes of suffering. And so doing, remove the suffering. And then when that's done, boop, enlightenment. But the first thing is the recognition of suffering. And in the Bhagavad Gita, I, I don't know, you know the story, you know, the, the big war is about to happen, the good guys against the bad guys, and it's everybody. And at the same time, it, it's all family. They're all cousins. They're all related, and they're fighting each other, getting ready to destroy each other. So, Krishna is acting as Arjuna's charioteer in the war. He said, I'm not going to fight, but I'll help you, and I'll help the other guys too. But they chose his army, which was already sealing the fate of the whole thing. Because where Krishna is, is victory. There's no two ways about it. So immediately, anyway, so he was a charioteer. And so they, Arjuna says, the morning of the first battle, take me up on that hill. I want to look out at the armies, you know. And he looks out, and he sees on both sides his family, his gurus, his teachers. And his, the bow drops from his hand, and he says, I can't, I won't fight. I will not slaughter these people who I owe my life to. That chapter is called the yoga of the despair or the desolation of Arjuna. That's the first step, the recognition that we are screwed. <laughs> Just waking up in this world, we're qualified for almost nothing but suffering until we get our shit together to deal with it directly. So it's not when you feel bad only, when you, it's when you recognize that nothing is going to bring what you're really looking for, that's when you really get a deeper realistic motivation for practice and for, for whatever the spiritual path means to you. But there are specific practices you can do, you know, if you, you know, that's just not my thing. I, you know, I know about those because many of the teachers that I have are Tibetan lamas and Vajrayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism. So, but I got my little thing over here, my monkey, you know. So that's, that's who I relate with mostly. And the, all the other teachings help me to release my stuff so I can spend more time with the monkey, so to speak. So, but spending time with the monkey means living in my heart and being relieved from, released from my own negative reactions to my own stuff, you know? So, yeah. So in the moment that you experience an ouch, yeah. not an I mean ouch, mm -hmm. what do you do? I get angry. <laughs> Fuck, really? You know, you're going to do this to me? You know, and then I, I, I see myself, I think, you know, and eventually I just laugh if it's about me. 
But if it's something really painful, really deep, you don't fight it. You try to give it space to be there. It's going to be there one way or the other. So you try to give it, you, you try not, you can't say don't react, that doesn't work. But you can say, okay, let's you, uh, allow it to be. Don't, don't, don't have righteous indignation that, that you stubbed your toe. <laughs> you know, let it be. Oh, okay. You know, and be with it. And that immediately, first of all, it separates you from the immediate reaction. It takes all the energy, a lot of the energy away from it. For instance, driving <clears throat> is a great way to experience suffering. <laughs> you, you know, so now what I try to do is I try to imagine that everyone driving on the road is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And if the Dalai Lama wants to cut me off, fine. <laughs> if he wants to like, what do they call it, uh, trailgate, tailgate me, tailgate me like, you know, inches away from my car, instead of hitting the brake and making that person have a heart attack and almost hitting my car, I say, okay, Your Holiness, yeah, okay, very nice, thank you. You know, it works about minus 2% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but just th just thinking about it that way already takes a lot of the immediate sting out of it and the other thing is <clears throat> they say which is what I say when I don't know what I'm talking about they say that every single thing that we experience, every minute of every day of our lives, is dictated by our own karmic situation, which includes your parents, your school, your upbringing, everything that happened to you. They're all agents of karma. So, when, you, when something really negative happens, the cause of that negativity is not necessarily right now. It's from the past, even if it's last year, last life, or five million lifetimes ago. And so if you can recognize that and, and have some spaciousness around the immediate reaction or after the immediate reaction is kind of caught you, oh, okay, so... Everything that's happening, the fact that I lost my job, the fact that I had this car accident, the fact that my wife left me, the fact that the television doesn't work and the cable doesn't work and there's no food in the refrigerator, all this. So how you are with that has a lot to do with how the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. So I don't think that's an, a mental up level. I mean, it can be. People say, oh, it's all my karma. But they don't deal with it, you see. They just say, okay, and they just go make more karma. But I don't think it's, it's a, a useless mental up-leveling to recognize that everything, even how we think about things, how we see the world, how we see everybody in this room, how we see, how we hear everything that's being said, all of that is karmically determined. So if something heavy happens in our life, even though we don't see the cause for it, how, why? And this is beyond our pay grade. But you can give it the space instead of immediately engaging, or after you immediately engage and finally relax a little bit, you can kind of find a way to let go and relax the mind about it. It's very useful, but finding that space and that ability to release is the same as when we're chanting and you notice you're not paying attention, you release it and come back. If you do that for two hours, that the releasing keeps echoing through the day. 
So the more we practice, the more we put ourselves in a position to engage with any situation that arises in a better way. So, yeah. <clears throat> You've already addressed some of this, but I wanted to ask specifically about working with intergenerational trauma and self-loathing. And self-loathing. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> That's where I'm an expert. <laughs> well, you know, they, I, I'm not sure about the, the, the newest scientific technology about this, but a few years ago I read somewhere that the trauma, traumatic experiences are registered in the DNA, in the sheath around the DNA. And that is trans transmitted from generation to generation. So what happened to my grandmother in Russia, you know, a hundred, well, she lived to be 104. So whatever, I'm, st I'm still dealing with that. Yeah. So we're, which is really interesting because it shows, it proves factually, scientifically, that we're all one, <laughs> you know? And if you're Jewish, it's always bad. <laughs> the mantra is like gut, you know? So, but whatever it is, whatever trauma it is, whatever, however it finds its way into your daily life, the best possible thing you can do is practice. And therapy, counseling, etc., 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 it's all good. But the ability to let go doesn't come from more of this, it comes from letting go. And that's what we do when we chant. We sing. And when we notice that we've been gone for God knows how long, if he's paying attention, we come back. We let go and we come back again and again and again and again and again and again. And that changes, they, they've proven that changes the neural pathways in the brain even. So along with, with whatever other practices you're doing, the actual just sitting down or remembering to let go again and again is what gives you the inner magnetism or the inner uh, gravity, a deeper sense of inner gravity that releases, lets stuff go off and holds you deeper in your own heart. So the content, you know, pretty much it's the same for everybody. We suck, We'll always suck, and everybody always sucks, and that's it. That's the three rules of life. You know? So inside of that, there's a lot of letting go to do, you know? So. And you know, boy. So when... when I guess it's Krishna says in the Gita, the soul is not born, it doesn't die, you can't cut it, it doesn't, doesn't get wet, etc. It's, it's beyond all that. That's the saving grace. No matter how screwed up this world is, no matter how screwed up our minds and our emotions are, what's in there is always 100% okay. There is no, there's no wiggle room in that. But we're not in touch with that. And so there's a really cool book called Going on Being by Mark Epstein, Buddhist psychiatrist. And in the middle of the book, there was this thing that really blew my mind. He, he's talking about Buddha's, the period just as Buddha was approaching his moment of enlightenment, or awakening. He was sitting under this tree and starving himself to death, breathing like 10 times a day. You know, just not eating. <clears throat> and he was in terrible despair. 
because he was doing everything that could be done according to the teachings that were available at that time. And he, he knew that it wasn't enough. He didn't have it yet. And if he did any more, the body was going to die. And that wasn't, that's not the game. So he didn't know what to do. So he's in terrible despair, sitting there. And then he's got his five disciples sitting there watching him, waiting for him to get enlightened so they could get a piece of it. So they're sitting there and he's sitting here under this tree, you know, and he's just like going through hell. He's in terrible despair. What can, there's nothing more he can do. And it still hasn't happened because he, he knew intuitively what, what he didn't know, no, but he knew that it wasn't enough. So then a memory came to him of when he was a boy. And he was in a, in a, sitting under a tree in a field, and his father, who was the king, was doing a ceremonial plowing of a, of a piece of the field in the distance. And sitting under that tree as a boy, he naturally had entered into a very sublime, blissful state without even trying as a kid, because his karmas were like that. He had that. So while he was sitting under the tree now as an adult, he remembered that feeling, all right? And he, he, it scared him because he's starving himself to death. And now all of a sudden he remembers this blissful feeling. He actually experiences it for a minute. And then he goes, okay, okay, all right, chill out, dude, he says to himself. His exact words. <laughs> he said, what is this feeling? So he looked at the feeling and he know, recognized that this pleasant feeling did not come from the meeting of the senses with the pleasurable object, which is what we call pleasure, which we like. Nor did it come from the, the separating of the senses with an unpleasant object, which we like. It was, wasn't caused by either one of those things, which are the only two options for pleasure. And yet it was pleasurable, so he said, it must be natural. It has no cause. And he said, hmm, it may be th through this feeling. Maybe this feeling is the way to enlightenment. Then he thought, nah, maybe I should eat some. <laughs> Woman walks by with some kheer or yogurt, and he puts his hands out. She pours some food in. He eats. The five disciples look at each other and goes, oh, Gotama has left the path. And they went off. Left him there. He wandered further into the jungle. And that's why we know about him now. Because he recognized this feeling within us of goodness, of, of not goodness, but of okayness is natural to us. Everybody has it. But we forgot. We don't know how to find it. We've forgotten to look. We don't know how to look. So, that's why we're sitting here. <laughs> you know, when, when 573 channels are not enough, that's when you recognize you need to do some practice. Yeah, when, uh, go, go ahead. I'm going to sit, I'm sitting here having a thought I don't want to say. Please. So I'm going to say it. Okay, you can say it to her, not to me. And uh, I'll give you a context. I'm a psychotherapist. Huh. And I get concerned when I hear in spiritual teachings that emotions are bad and anyone are negative. They hurt, that's all. I mean, negative emotions hurt, positive emotions feel good. Yeah. And so what I wanted to say about that is, I want, what I'd like to hear from you about is that it is, is that Carl Jung said emotions are the language of the soul. And so I teach clients that their emotions are about them, and it gives them the right to, the, the way to know how the outside world is affecting their own essential life. In other words, so emotions become how, they're, but they're mine, they're not yours. Kubler Ross taught that a 15 sec, anger is a 15 second emotion mm -hmm. if you use it appropriately. It taps you on the shoulder and then you say, okay, what's the information? And then you use yourself. 
And what does it mean to use it appropriately? appropriately? What does that mean? About how you, what's, what's, what's appropriate for you in the next moment, which might be to practice. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious how you hold, and then, oh, and then today you said you should, ba you should trust your basic instinct. I didn't say, I don't remember basic instinct, I said intuition. Intuition, okay, mm -hmm. so you trust your intuition. And how you, how you um, experience intuition that is separate from emotion. Well, so let's say you're sitting there and maybe I say something that pisses you off, that you have an anger emotion, right? Where does the emotion happen? Simply. Yeah, in you, right? Yeah. In my body. I feel it in my body and certain parts of my mind. And your mind, right? I mean, who, your so mind's... My mind comes later. I experience... I don't know which comes first, actually. Well, let's your just... mind has a thought about it. One that's way thoughts. Way. Okay. You're not thinking about it. So, you feel it. Uh, who's feeling it? What's feeling it? You say you feel it, so what is feeling it? Closest I can come to that is saying my body feels it. No, your body's not saying nothing about it. Your body's having an experience. But how do you know your body's feeling it? Because, my, because I gather some thoughts about it and I name it. I name that experience in my body with a particular word, anger, sadness, mm -hmm. pleasure. What's aware of the naming and the feelings and uh, the thoughts? My mind, I guess. My mind. Don't guess. Don't guess. What, what's aware of your thoughts in you? Well, I like to talk about it as a witness observer. Witness observer. A part of me that can be aware but isn't in it. Okay. Is that aware, that part of you involved with labeling and conceptual, conceptualizing the issue, the, the experience? The answer to that for sure. I think that that part of me is noticing that I'm living mm -hmm. and drawing a story and beginning to build a whole story about what's going on. Be I like to think that part has no agenda, that it can just simply be aware of what's happening right now. We like to think a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what I'm getting at is um, you. Uh, you're talking about emotions, but the emotions happen within a field of awareness or consciousness. It's like you're looking out at me. You're looking at me. You see me, you're labeling me, uh, all kinds of things. But we don't see the seeing. We see what we're see we see the object that we're seeing, but we don't see the seeing itself. This is when you turn awareness back on itself. This is the highest teachings. It's called uh, Dzogchen or Mahamudra. It's becoming aware of awareness. And awareness is like this, the space that everything's in. It doesn't come, it doesn't go. It has clarity and awareness. It doesn't label. So when you were at the original question you asked, that's the answer to it. 
you might someday experience, we all might someday experience, the, the space in which our me and our stuff lives, exists. Oh, it's, it's hard to talk about because I don't know what I'm talking about, that's why. But it's hard to talk about. <clears throat> but the question was, there's a deeper space than everything you talked about that you mentioned that's within you and within me. Everything is an object of that awareness, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, everything, our body, you, and what we feel sensi sensory in our bodies. There's an awareness in which all that exists. And that's the answer to what you asked. How do you, I forget what the original question was. There was something about what's underneath the emotions or how do you? How you hold emotions, the value of emotions and the value of instinct. I don't think you used the word value at the, at the beginning. No, I didn't use it, I'm clarifying now. Because, okay. Because what I hear often- I see, okay, teachers, yeah, yeah. Is there's no value in emotions. Oh, no. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just concerned about it being called negative. No, well, there's negative emotions, there's positive emotions. Well, I think they all have a positive, and, a positive and useful function for us, used appropriately. Uh-huh. Well, most of us can't, don't know how to use them appropriately. I mean, they're usually using us, you know, so. Uh, but once again, like I mentioned to him, you know, there's ways to deal with those that energy, those are not the practices that I usually do. And we were talking basically about unhappy emotions, emotions that cause us suffering, and how do we deal with that? When I said, I'll do 108 chalices, that doesn't mean I'm trying to push them away necessarily. But what, I, what that does for me is it opens up the space in which I live so that I'm no longer glued only to those negative feelings. In this case, it was negative feelings. So it opens up the space, and then there's that feeling, and, you know, and there's some space around it. I'm here, too. So in that sense, it, the value of that experience was that it enabled me to do a practice that uh, opened me up in a certain kind of way. But uh, no, no, I, I wouldn't say that all emotions are bad. I don't... You can't ignore them, you can't avoid them, so what's the sense of fighting with them? You know, yeah, but to learn how to work with them is big time stuff. Because mostly we spend our whole lives just being pushed around by every single thing we think or feel. But, uh, yeah. More? No, don't give up on me. <laughs> no, no, come on. We have to live daily life. I, I understand this awareness beyond the awareness I was talking about. Mm -hmm. I understand it. I'm not sure I've experienced it. Yeah. And on a day to day basis, how I know what's happening in my life that matters to me is mm -hmm. through my emotional reaction to mm -hmm. a large degree. Okay. And so I'm looking for that connection between the, the value of being able to name, which most of which especially men in this culture have never been given much opportunity. And women don't have anger as a possibility, so they can, that can't, that's not theirs in this world. That, that what I help people gain is that full range again of possibility of language for themselves of what life is doing to them. Mm -hmm. Now, the point is that that doesn't get to make the decision about what I do next. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's more like, oh, that's the information. Now, I'll go through my aid, what I've learned and know, and my spiritual development, which is in my prefrontal lobe, and decide what's the next appropriate right action. And that, that emotions are valuable as a tool for you to know yourself and to know what is the next right action you want to make. Okay? So when my anger comes up, there's something that's not working here, like mm -hmm. Ukraine, for instance. I feel enraged about that often if I really stop and look at it much. Mm -hmm. And so I have to take that and to let that go and decide what I'm going to do with my awareness. What's that anger about? I hate that those people are being hurt in this way. So I can send my love now to those people. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, I think always it's just information that, I, that I, I, you can learn to have. And that's one of the things that I would probably call, I don't know, what, I don't know how you define instinct, but for me, intuition. Mm-hmm. I just I have I have a concern that people think that emotions aren't valuable and that they're that they're that if I have sadness and people in this culture, if we have sadness, mm -hmm. we're not supposed to be very long. If I have fear, we're not supposed to be, you know, we're not supposed to be anxious or act that or have that anxious actually have a message for me. If I have anger, I'm not supposed to realize mm -hmm. something's not working for me. I need to mm -hmm. take an action. I need to at least name it to myself so I can that's, that's, Yeah. that are dead. Yeah. And so my job is to help them get back in their bodies and learn how to feel again. Mm -hmm. The first feelings they have to have are very painful. Mm -hmm. and, very, and then following that, a lot of grief, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which is also, we consider grief painful. <clears throat> you know, I just see that as a necessary act, part of, as necessary a part of life for us to live as humans in these bodies mm -hmm. on this earth. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So it's a very good practice to do, for sure. But you, one has to buy into it. I mean, one has to engage in it fully to do it. Most of us are not doing that full time in terms of in that discipline that you're talking about with the therapist in those in that situation. And regardless, positive or negative emotions, the ability to release whatever it is that's got you is a, is a good thing to be able to do. And that's very simply when we chant, again, you sing, and when you notice you're not paying attention, you sing. And that empowers us tremendously to, as we go through the day, to, to uh, find a more... Uh, graceful way of kind of living in general. I used to see a, a Jungian analyst out in L.A. for a couple of years, I used, year, in the 80s when I was out there. What was his name? Marvin Spiegelman. He, wrote a, he went to India, actually. He wrote a book about India and Jung and stuff like that. Then I moved away. You have to give Nina some rupees, yeah? Oh, she's got her posse around her. Everybody over there. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Hi. This is a question, uh, sort of shifting gears, about Maharaji. And um, I've been reading a lot of stories about him saving people's lives, mm -hmm. uh, intervening. And how does that fit in with karma? And how is he, this may be above your pay grade, I know, but... How is he deciding when he's going to intervene and how that impacts that individual's karma? You'll have to ask him. <laughs> I have a feeling you're going to say that, but I have to ask. <laughs> Nothing else? Well, yeah, you know. Uh, uh, For 
first of all, I, I have no, uh, <clears throat> I don't think there's anybody in there deciding, first of all. I mean, it's like, that wouldn't be, that's not kosher. You know, there, there, a liberated being doesn't have any agenda even, other than compassion. And so, and they don't need anything, so they never, they're, they're free to give all the time. He used to say, people tried to give him money, some of the Westerners tried to give him, you know, make some donation. He wouldn't take any donations from us at all. He said, all the money in the, in, in the universe is mine. See, even the money in America. So, okay, who's talking? You know, what do you mean? <laughs> so things like that, you know. Um, there's this line, this phrase that I often, it's suspending disbelief. Our minds chop things up immediately, all the time. And we can't conceive of anything that's beyond concepts and thoughts, and I want to understand, how does that work? How does he make that decision? How does he know that? He doesn't know that. You know, on and on and on. If we're ever going to get free of what hurts us and the effect that has on us and closing us down, we're going to have to suspend the... We're going to have to... Uh, we're going to have to admit to ourselves there might be some things that can't be understood the way we usually understand things. And in, an enlightened being is, qualifies as that. But even to imagine that there is such a thing as enlightenment or true freedom from uh, from whatever. The love that I experience in his presence and experience in his presence is of a different kind, a quality that anything I had ever imagined could be possible. It was completely not based on who I am, who I think I am. It was shining like the sun on everyone and everything equally. Now, that doesn't mean he treated each person exactly the same. In fact, he related with each individual. Just like Krishna made love with the gopis. With 108 gopis, he manifested a form for them and loved them in the very way each one wanted to be loved. They had their own... They liked this taste or that taste, right? So... That's what a, an enlightened being has no... His cent, the center of enlightened being is everywhere. Not here or there. It, the whole... The universe is the center of their being. So... You know, when I was in Auschwitz with Bernie Glassman, the first time I went, you can't imagine how beautiful it is there in the fall. The grass is green and the trees are, the leaves are turning, there are, you know, lovely colors and the sky is blue. And I, for three days, the first three days, I was walking around and I was screaming at whoever, how can you shine on this place? At the sun, I was how dare you shine on this place, right? I mean, you can't imagine they have a, a room full of false teeth. They have a room full of glasses. 
they have a room full of things that they just took off of people and threw in a room. It's like, it's astounding. It's beyond. And I just was raging. And I'm screaming at the sun. How can you fucking shine on this place? How dare you shine on this place, right? After a few days, something clicked inside of me. And I went, oh, it's your nature to shine. You shine on everything. This place, that place, good people, bad people, this, everything. You shine on everything and everyone equally. The shining is equal. It's not based on what you're shining on. It's your nature to shine. And that was, that's Maharaji. He shines on everything. All the great beings are like that. They shine. It's their nature to shine. There's nothing, there's no obstruction to the shining anymore. There's no choosing, picking and choosing like we do. I like you. I don't like you so much, but I like you a lot. You know, that's not, it's not that level of shining. It was a big thing for me, a really big thing. You know, it was really, um, and that's what, that's when I'm in that presence, that's what I feel, that kind of love, that, sh that it's not about me, he's not shining on me. I didn't even know there's a he. The shining is not for me, it's always there. I just happen to brought myself out into the sun to feel it at this moment. I forget what you asked. <laughs> it was about karma and Maharaji. Yeah, Maharaji knows everything. He's proven that to me many times and to every, anybody who's ever been around him. But, that, but his actions are not based on the karma. They shine, he shines, and the shining changes things. And It was extraordinary. Everyone who came got something, you know. A, a farmer who lost, who had nothing but a little hut that leaked in the rain and one, one spoon and an old metal plate to eat on, he lost his ox, his oxen, the only thing he had, the water buffalo to, uh, he was given a water buffalo. You know, I mean, everybody got something. Not always, we couldn't always see what it was in that moment, but there's this line in the Binaya Chalisa, which was a, a hymn that was written about Maharaji. It's that you wander, to, you, wander you're, you continually wander to just to distribute alms. That's all he's doing. He's just distributing all the time, giving. And he, he had nothing. I mean, he, he had a blanket and a dhoti, that's it. And he, although... His, he came from a wealthy family of, of farmers and the family owned land. He just walked away. It's something you have to feel, you know. And it's not something that we are... Uh, exposed to in this culture, really. I mean, unconditional love is something that we're not really, we, 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 it's not what we, unconditional means unconditional. It, it, means you, it means you don't love your kids more than somebody else's kids. So that, to us, that's like, what are you talking about? Of course I love my children more than somebody else's children, but that's not unconditional. There's conditions, and that's what we have here in the West and in the world, conditions about everything. But these great beings are like, they shine like the sun. They, nor can you buy it. You know, you can't, when the clouds are out, you, you can't, there's no way you can, you know. But the clouds were in our own heads. You see, we would sit there with him, and our minds were going on, our stuff, you know, and we're going, oh, I'm so close, I can't feel anything, this is terrible, I'm here. 
And then, you know, you get hit in the heart with a banana. And you look, and he's going, ah. And then you're in the room, you know? You're in the room where the love lives. Ah. And then after a few minutes, you, you take yourself out of the room. And then he brings you back in the room. And then this is, what, this is how he taught. He didn't teach with words so much. But he would bring us in that room. He would, he would dissolve the clouds in our heads, and then we could see this, feel the sun. And then the clouds came back, because that's who we were at the time. That's who we felt. We had no clue about practice or what it means to let go or anything. We were just there. So it's compli- I mean, but. I mean, I don't, <clears throat> why he does what he does is beyond our pay grade. For instance, there was a couple from New York with us in the early days with Maharaji, Ed and Chris. They got the names Sunanda, and his, the, boy, the guy's name was Sudama. And Ed and Chris wanted to get married, and they asked Maharaji to marry them. And Maharaji says, nay. Krishna will also marry you. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? So the next day we stood in front of the Hanuman temple and I guess, I think we read from the Bible or something. <laughs> Don't ask me. It's my sugar. And then, so they're married, okay. Shortly after that, they left India, went back to New York. Um, and this is, a, this is, a, you, I'm going to tell you this story, and this is going to bring us to this moment where there's no way to understand this, okay? Except to dis- suspend disbelief, all right? You ready? Okay. So Ed and Chris came back, Sunanda and Sudama. Then they, they got divorced. Uh, they had a kid. They got divorced. Years went on, Sunanda had cancer, and uh, she, for many years, she, she tried everything, the bee stings, every, every therapy there was, she tried everything, and she was continually working with that. Sudama developed something, some disease, and he needed a heart and lung transplant. I mean, no oxygen was coming into his system. So I hadn't seen him for a really long time. And then I was in India, and we met this really nice Baba, young Baba, and we brought him back to America, Indian guy. And we went to somebody's house, and the woman whose house it was told this Baba about Sudama and how he was suffering. So the Baba looks at me and said, tomorrow morning we're going to go see him, okay? So we drove into Queens, and he knew we were coming. We drove into Queens, we knocked on the door. It took him 20 minutes to get to the door. He had a crawl on the ground. He couldn't, you know. So we came in the apartment, and the Baba sat on this couch, and me and Sudama sat on the floor, and he said, sing Chalisa. So I sang Hanuman Chalisa, and Sudama was mouthing the words. He couldn't make any sound. And we were there for a while, and then we, we left. So that evening, we were back at the house, and Sudama calls, and he asked to talk to me, and uh, I got to the phone, and he, he thanked me. He said he felt that Maharaji had come back to him after all these years, and he was just so happy. And in the morning, he was dead. Six months later, his son died of an accidental overdose of heroin. Six months later, his former wife died from cancer after like 10 years of struggle. So within one year, the whole family was gone. Now, the name Sudama is the name of Krishna's boyhood friend. And they used to go out, take care of the cows together. Krishna was a cowboy. 
and uh, one night, one day, they were hiding from a rainstorm in a tree, and they fell asleep in the tree. And Sudama woke up first, and he was hungry, so he ate his lunch. But he, and he was still hungry, so Krishna was still asleep. So he took Krishna's lunch and he ate Krishna's lunch. Now, it's probably not a good idea to eat God's lunch without permission. <laughs> And Krishna woke up and he didn't say anything. But as a result of that action, as Sudama got older, he became impoverished, he became blind. Karmically, they, this is the way it's explained in the books. And he lived with his family in a rickety old hut and they were totally poor and everything. So um, <clears throat> Sudama's wife was constantly on his back. Go see your friend Krishna. He's become a king now. He'll help us. You got to, you know, but Sudama was just too embarrassed. He was, you know, so poor and blind. Finally, the wife takes a, a, a little packet of parched rice, puts it in Sudama's bag, kicks him out of the house and says, don't come back until you see Krishna. So Sudama makes his way to the, to the palace, but he's still so embarrassed. He sits in front of the palace with the beggars, the other beggars, and at some point, Krishna comes out, and he sees Sudama, and he says, Sudama, I can't believe you're here. What, what are you doing here? Come on in. And takes him in the palace. They have a nice meal. And finally, Krishna says to Sudama, did you bring anything for me? Did you bring anything for me? So Sudama doesn't say anything. Krishna grabs his bag. He says, what do you have? What do you have? He says, you have the we used to eat this rice when we were kids. Oh, it's so great. And Krishna ate up all that. Dry parched rice. And he was, this is so great. I can't believe you brought this to me. And then he says, I'm a king now. I got to go all the, do all this bullshit. Why don't you, you, you go, why don't you go home and come back, you know, anytime. So Sudama makes his way. He gets back to his village because, you know, he's blind, but he knows the way around. He gets to the, the place where the lane to his little hut is. And there's this rickety old fence and he touches the fence, and there's this solid wall there, right? He's blind, right? But he, this solid wall. This is weird, because I know I'm in the right place. He makes his way along the wall where this rickety old wood gate used to be, and now there's this metal thing, you know? What is this? He's standing there. What's going on here? You know, this, I know I'm in the right place. And then his wife and kids come running out to the gate, and they say, look, you, mu you must have asked Krishna to help us. Look what he did. He turned our little hut into like a beautiful house. Maharaji gave Ed the name Sudama. It was the end of his life. The, old, the real Sudama received blessings of Krishna at the end towards the end of his life. And now Sudama calls me and says, now Maharaji's come back to him after all these years. And the next day he's gone. Now, the point is, I remembered when they asked Maharaji to marry them. And Maharaji said, nay, Krishna Das will marry you. I think, my feeling is that at that moment, Maharaji saw their karmas, and because he can see unlimited in all directions, he could see that the best way for them to live out these karmas was to actually go through this in one lifetime. Hopefully, one lifetime. And so, at the very least, he allowed those karmas to run out to run the way they were going to run and didn't interfere because he could have changed that. I mean, he could do anything, really. I, this is something I can't prove to you, but you, you're stupid enough to be here, so you have to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> he could do anything at any time for anyone, but he didn't. And that was also a doing by not doing 
So I had written that in my book, Chance of a Lifetime. And the editor kept taking it out. I kept putting it back. She'd take it out, and I'd put it back. She'd take it out, and I'd put it back. Finally, I realized this is something that can't be understood, and so I took it out. I left it out of the book. But if the only mo if the motivation of these great beings is compassion, and it is, none of these great beings need to be here for their own sake. This is hard to understand, but they no longer have a personal agenda. When I was going to kill myself in the temple, Maharaji looked at me and said, what are you going to do, jump in the river? Ha ha ha. He said, you can't die. Worldly people don't die. Only Jesus died the real death. And then he said, because he never thought of himself. He, that being, in that being, no me. There was no me anymore. So, if the only motivation of these great beings is compassion, then everything they do is they're doing the best they can for everyone all the time, or at least the people they're connected with, if not everyone in the world. See, this is the moment that I was telling you about. You have to suspend disbelief if you're going to sleep at night. Otherwise, you're going to go, oh, a bunch of bullshit, what is he talking about? Guy, nobody knows everything. Nobody can do those things. Hey, I'm here. That's a fucking miracle. You know how many times I almost died in this life alone? Every time I jump off or fall off the cliff, a lot of times I was jumping, he moved the cliff, and I landed flat on my face instead of 5,000 feet down, crushed. He has saved me. So many times, it's ridiculous. But, you know, I can't prove it to you. I can't prove it to you. That Jewish guy who started Christianity, what was his name, Saul? Paul. He said a few things that were pretty cool, actually. He said, by grace was I saved through faith. Faith is like a dirty word for us, you know, because we usually think of blind faith, accepting somebody or something that we don't really believe. But, but real faith is very different. Real faith is like confidence that we can get through it. We have what we need. Whatever arises, we can get through it one way or another. And that's a big thing. I mean, if you ever read the papers these days, you know what a big thing it is just to get through the day. We are all so blessed just, just to be able to even think about this kind of living, a living that doesn't involve violence and greed and hatred, a living that that aspires to real love and caring for other beings and is involved in anger and, and political intrigue and manipulations and killing people for no fucking reason. We're very lucky. And this is not just luck, it's our karmas, our own karmas. We ourselves, over many lifetimes, have come to this place, or so they say. So, people would come, Maharaji, Maharaji, can you cure me? Can you cure my wife? Can you cure my... He said, go ask Hanuman. He'll do it. So they go to Hanuman, and what does Hanuman say? Just ask Ram, what do I have to do with it, you know? 
Siddhi Mahat say, ask Maharaji. Maharaji say, ask Hanuman. Hanuman say, Ram. What does Ram say? Nothing. He just does it. We've all bought into a story. Each one of our lives is some kind of story. And we're invested in that story. The question is whether that story is going to bring us what we really want in life. And what we need to do to make that happen, to allow that to happen for us. My favorite story, one of my favorite stories about Maharaji is, is in the book uh, Divine Reality, which is a free download on my website. Because we couldn't, it was written in India, published there, but we couldn't get it here anymore, so I took it upon myself to make it available. There's a particular room in hell that I'll go to for that, but that's okay. So it involves, Maharaji was, many years ago, Maharaji was in a, uh, in uh, one of his devotees' house, this old man. And um, the old man had a granddaughter who was about eight years old at the time. And she came running into the house one day because she'd seen somebody die, somebody who died in one of the neighbor's houses. And she was really upset, so upset about it. And she came running into the house and came to my heart and said, Baba, and she was crying, crying, crying. And Maharaj said, what is it? What is it? What's wrong? What's wrong? What do you want? What do you want? Whatever it is, tell me what you want. And she looks up at Maharaj and she said, Baba, this is an eight-year-old girl. When I die, would you bring me back to life? So he didn't say anything at that point, apparently. He just patted her on the head, sent her away. So then... Many years go by. It's got to be 30, 40 years maybe, or 30 years go by. The grandfather died. That young girl's father moved somewhere. She got married and lived in a different town. And they lost contact with Maharaji because it was the grandfather who was the devotee. And now the father, the girl's father, had a different guru. So the woman falls very ill. In fact, she's dying. And her husband calls her father and tells her, tells him that, she, that her, his daughter is very close to death. So he goes to his guru and he says, Guruji, please save my daughter. And the guru closes his eyes for a while. And he says, you pray to Nim Karoli Baba. He's the only one who can do that. So the father goes somewhere and he starts praying to Maharaji. So at that moment, there's a knock on the door of the daughter's house, the woman's house. Her husband opens the door and he sees this bulky gentleman in a blanket. He doesn't know who he is. And this bulky gentleman says, your wife is ill? And he says, no, 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 she's died. Can I see her? Yes, come in. And the bulky gentleman goes into the room where the woman is lying, basically dead. And he says, she's not dead. Do you have any grapes in the house? Bring me grapes and a spoon. So the husband brings some grapes. He squeezes the grapes, and some of the juice trickles into her, the woman's mouth. And she begins to revive. And then he leaves. And the woman revived and lived for many years. That was the little girl. He promised 30 more years before. No one had to send him a telegram. Nobody had to call him to remind him he promised. He shows up because he said he would. Now, that he could do that is one thing. That's pretty impressive, all right? But that he would do that, that's even more impressive. 
I don't know if you understand what I mean. It's just the love and caring and compassion that's within which all that ability is, is what was really functioning there. And so he showed up because he said he would. That's what really impresses me. I've seen all the miracles, you know. <laughs> it was a great story about the, there was this doctor, who, a young man graduates from medical school and he comes to Maharaji and Maharaji says, this is up in the hills. He asked what, what he should do. He said, you should go around to all the villages and give free medical care to the people in the villages who have no doctors. So that's what the guy did. He had an office in Nainital, but he would go to all the villages. And so one day he comes to see Maharaji and Maharaji says, go to the hospital now. But Baba, I'm fine. Go to the hospital now. Okay. So he goes, uh, he stops and sees his brother and then he goes to the hospital. He walks in the door of the hospital, has a heart attack and essentially dies. After Maharaji sent him away, Maharaji started repeating it over and over to himself, like he did all the time, over and over. He would, the doctor is a good man, gonna die. Doctor is a good man, gonna die. Doctor is a good man, gonna die. So he goes walking down the road. In those days, there was another Baba in the area called Telephone Baba. And he was called Telephone Baba because he used to have the shawl around his neck, around his shoulders. And it was believed that he could speak to the, the gods. What he would do, he would take his shawl and hold it up to his ear. And he would talk to the gods. And if somebody needed something, he would, you know, he would talk to the gods and say, okay, now, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go. So Maharaji goes to see him and says, doctor's a good man, gonna die, call Vishnu. So he goes up, not picking up. <laughs> doctor's a good man, gonna die, call him again. Oh, Narada says he's with Lakshmi and doesn't want to be disturbed. <laughs> Apparently, Maharaj said, miserable fuck, what's he doing with Lakshmi when there's word to, work to do? So then he said, so then he reaches out with his hand like this, and this Baba had this long hair. He grabs the Baba's hair and just picks him up off the ground like this. He says, call Shiva. <laughs> Baba goes, the doctor sits up in the hospital perfectly well. <laughs> This happened. I wish, I, I wish I could tell you it, maybe it happened, but it didn't maybe happen. It happened. I met the people who saw that happen. They told me themselves. Come on. It's crazy. There was a great Baba in, uh, named Tajuddin Maharaj who was a, a Sufi saint, and he was very close with Shirdi Sai Baba. He used to wander around naked. And unfortunately for him, he was wandering around the tennis courts of the British people naked. So they put him in an insane asylum. So every Thursday, which was this, the Sufi day, thousands of people would come to the insane asylum for darshan. <laughs> so after a few years, they had to let him out, you know? India is something else. I mean, you know, come on. It's like a fucking comic book. Anything you can imagine and write in a comic book, it already happened there. It's not important to believe these miracles and all this stuff, but you got to admit it's kind of cool. And it kind of... If we look at our lives and where we spend our time in our heads as the days go by, boring, you know, and, and very few moments of real uh, rapture, real love that isn't 
for anything specific. It's our true nature. It's the seat, it's consciousness, it's awareness. It has qualities of compassion and natural clarity and openness. This is not where we live most of the time. The names that we chant, the words that we chant, are the sound form of those states. So when and if the mind or the attention rests at ease in the sound, something opens up inside. Something that you, is, is not a button you can push. You're not doing it. We're not doing it. We are creating with our desire and our aspiration causes and conditions for that to arise which is all we can do, which is all we have to do, because we can't make the universe already happen. We don't have to create it again. We just have to live in it in a good way. There's a story about this great saint, uh, uh, Papa Ramdas was his name. He was from southern India. One time he, was, he had been begging for food and he finally got some food and sat down under a tree and a dog came and stole the vegetables and ran away with the vegetables. And Papa Randas ran after the dog with this ch trying to get him to take the chapatis too. <laughs> so... We can't fool ourselves. We do, but we know we are doing that somewhere in us. It's not easy to be honest with ourselves. We have agendas. And Ramana Maharshi said, asking the mind or the ego to kill the ego uh, is like asking the thief to be the policeman. There'll be a lot of investigation, but no arrest will ever be made. So we, it's not something we can go, we can't just kill this delusionary sense of separate self but we can dissolve it through practice. And nothing's lost. What we gain is the whole universe. Yeah, somebody? Namaste, Krishna Das. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been listening to your music for years. It's really nice to be here in person. And uh, I guess my question around like following, finding our own, our authentic path. You know, I've, I've been a yogi for many years and spent some time in India. I uh, spent some time with the, the Hare Krishna devotees and, and lots of different traditions. And I guess... You know, some of my teachers have been saying I'm just kind of dabbling all over the place. And they've suggested that there's value in going deep in one tradition. And I haven't, but yet I haven't had a, a moment like you described where you just like this knowing with Maharaj. I haven't, you know, and I'm not seeking guru per se, but 
and I'm not necessarily like attached, like I gotta figure it out right now. I know it will happen in divine timing, but I guess, do you have any insight, suggestions on, you know, it, should we find one path and go deep? Is it okay to continue exploring? I appreciate your insights, thank you. Well, thanks for thinking I have some insight. Um, yeah. Uh, I think you're doing fine. I wouldn't worry about it. And the people who want you to make a decision are probably the ones who will benefit from the decision you, they want you to make. So those are the people you run away from <laughs> as fast as possible. You're already you. You don't need to make another you. Just be you. And uh, just do what you want to do. Why wouldn't you? I, I'm no good at doing what I should do. That much I couldn't, you know, that's why my heart never told me what to do. Because he knew if he told me, there was no way I would do it. That's just my psychology. So... He, I had to find what, what I needed to do, what I wanted to do. That's what you have to find. Nobody can tell you. If they tell you, it's not yours. Unless somebody tells you and you go, right. Well, then who's deciding it's right, them or you? You. So it's always you. Just be happy. Don't worry about it. But keep digging the holes, that's all. I would just dig as many as possible. Finally, your, your whole earth will be a big hole. Oh. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I had to take notes because you spoke about so many things that <clears throat> contextually um, you have questions in the context of this moment. Can I ask you? Sure. Chalisa affords yourself a tool of service in all aspects of it. Oh, microphone, maybe battery. See? Is there? This is karma. <laughs> We're also reaching the time that the bladders are getting very full. I can feel it.
Or the question come before the bladders explode. That's the karma of the situation. So I understood that the Teresa is a tool that you abide in in all aspects of your experience in living. It's a go-to. That's what I understood. I also understood that Maharaji Ninkuali Baba, who I thank you very much for introducing me to, I never knew about him until I experienced you and Kirtan. Uh, had karmic awareness with your friends. That they knew to show up, oh, that the young girl knew to show up 30 mm. years later. And also in naming your friends that experienced those hardships and the disease karmically. Uh, do you use any divination tools in terms of your own practices and uh, expanding your awarenesses about karmas that are yours and in relationship to others in your in your world. Are you using divination tools? That was really the question. Such no. As, no. No. So the chilisa then is your source tool. Uh, I don't really know. I, I understand what you mean by divination tool. I don't think of the Chalisa that way. Okay, does it ever, in your chanting the Chalisa, do you ever have, we spoke about in tradition here, um, we spoke about feelings, they're all palpable. Does the Chalisa reveal guidance? Not to me. I'm too stupid. I just sing and try to get through the day without falling on my face more than 20 times. I don't really have, you know, I didn't even want that. Well, no astrology, no, no astrology, but astrology, no nope. jyotisha, nothing. Nope. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine to do those things. I, mean, yeah, I, no, I, no, I just no, don't. No, yeah. no, I had no anticipation of an expected answer from you. Simply, there was a, a conversation that happened here around mm -hmm. Taro and Jyotish, mm -hmm. and um, I wondered yeah. if you engage in practices. You know, I didn't bring those pictures. I meant to bring those pictures. Um, Maharaji knows everything. I don't have to know, because he knows. He's taking, he's running the show. He's running my show. So I don't have to think about it. All I have to do is connect with him, with that, which is always available, always here. That's the chalisa and the chanting. All of it brings me into that presence again and again and again. And anything that happens, happens. I don't have to know anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm in of that mind. I mean, I also um, had feelings of that way. I, I just wanted to. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm ready for the burning question since Thursday. Burning, that's sure. a long time to burn. Yeah, <laughs> it's been rough. Um, you shared. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned that um, just moments before he had said something and you wanted to push him. Yeah. I was wondering if you would share with us what happened. I don't remember exactly, but it was either he wanted to push me in the river or I wanted to. Well, those are the only two options in our relationship at that time. <laughs> it was either I was going in or he was going in. <laughs> uh, he was a cranky fucker in those days. But he was pissed off because Maharaji told him not to talk about him when he went back to America. But all he did was talk about him. And as a result, 
these Westerners arrived at Maharaji's place. And he was pissed off about that because they, we took Maharaji away from him. And uh, he, before he had them all to himself. And now we were all there. It was, he was very unhappy about that, on one hand. On the other hand, he, you know, he understood what it was all about. But one time, and Maharaji drove him crazy. I mean, he, he, he really, Ramdas had a lot of anger. And Maharaji was kind of, you know, jab him in the, in the ribs all the time about it. So one time, <clears throat> Ramdas had bought this Volkswagen bus from this couple who had driven across from Europe. And they were going south uh, to be with Swami Muktananda. So he bought the bus from them. And Maharaji looks at Ramdas and says, give the keys to him, me. Which was probably, you know, the worst thing he could have said to Ramdas. And then he said, and he said, and you're a saint. You shouldn't touch money. So from now on, don't touch money. So Ramdas gave his money to this other guy to take care of, buy bus tickets. You know, not everybody could fit on the boat. We were like 70 people on this Volkswagen bus, riding on the roof, hanging off the back, going through this, you know, the mountains of India where these, you know, it's like this. It was unbelievable. So one day, anyway, so one day, I don't know why, but Ramdas woke up and everybody had left for Kenchi. His money man had left for Kenchi. And Ramdas was at the, the hotel in Nainital, and the only option he had was to walk to Kenchi, which is about a four hour walk over the mountains. And the whole way, he was burning, ready to kill. And he gets into the temple, and all the Westerners are on one side of the courtyard. We were being fed by Maharaji, by the people. And, uh, and he walks into the courtyard, and the, the guy he hated most stood up and offered Ramdas a plate of food. <laughs> right in front, Maharaji is right there, right? He opened Ram, Ram, Ramdas took the food and pushed it in the guy's face. <laughs> Maharaji says, Ramdas, something wrong? Ramdas goes and says, Maharaji, I can't stand a dharma, you know, non whatever, holy stuff in people. I can't stand it. And I can't stand it in myself. So Maharaji goes, I don't see any dharma, you know, anything un impure in you. Ramdas started to cry. He said, Ramdas, love everyone and tell the truth. Ramdas said, the truth is, I don't love everyone. <laughs> Maharaji said, Ramdas, love everyone and tell the truth. So, and by the end of his life, I'd say there was a 99.9 .9 chance that Ramdas loved everyone and told the truth. I used to tease him. i say, you finally become who we thought you were 40 years ago. <laughs> he would laugh. So, yeah.